Hi everyone! In this video I'm going to be discussing the phases or states of matter of pure substances, that is to say their solid, liquid, and gas forms, and I'll also touch on the idea of the aqueous solution, the one type of mixture that we can actually represent with a single chemical formula. So I'd like to draw your attention to those green dots that are on the screen now. You all are familiar with solids, liquids, and gases, and in chemistry what we're really concerned about are the way that particles are arranged in those three states. I'd actually like to use an example of a specific element as we talk through the, these particle diagrams. And you can find a list of all the elements and their melting and boiling points on table S in your reference table. So if you want to have that handy, it may be useful to have out during this video. I'm going to imagine for just the sake of unusualness, that these green dots represent oxygen. They could represent any pure element or any pure compound. But let's say over here in this left-hand box, I actually have a sample of solid oxygen. I can denote that using a subscript S to show that the oxygen is not in its typical gas form, but instead is existing as a solid. This is possible as long as the temperature is low enough, and we'll take a look at that on table S in a second. But just like any other solid, oxygen solid would have a definite shape. That is to say, it would be able to hold its own when dropped into a box. And it also has a definite volume. It would take up a specific amount of space. If we heated things up just a little bit, beyond the melting point of oxygen. If you don't know what the melting point of oxygen is off the top of your head, you just go right to your reference table S and note that this would actually happen at 54 Kelvin, which is extremely cold, right? Kelvin is different from the Celsius scale, but just know at this point that 54 Kelvin is not very warm at all. So once we get above 54 Kelvin, this solid oxygen is going to turn into liquid oxygen, which again we can denote with a subscript L. And liquid oxygen is not going to have a definite shape. See how these particles have spread apart enough that they're able to take on the shape of the container. So we describe its shape as that of the container. However, this volume of oxygen is going to also be definite. No matter what container I put it in, its shape may be different, but it will always take up the same amount of space. So we still have a definite volume. That volume will never change regardless of the container that it's in. If we add a little bit more heat and raise that temperature a little bit more beyond the boiling point of oxygen, which according to table S is 90 Kelvin, which is again well, well, well below room temperature, we get oxygen in its more standard state as a gas, which again we can represent using a lowercase g. And all gases take on the shape of their container, like liquids. But what's really unique about gases is that they no longer have a definite volume. Their volume is entirely defined by the container. What we mean when we say this is that Unlike liquids or solids, if I put gases into, let's say, a closed beaker, the gas will automatically expand to fill the entirety of the beaker, unlike a liquid or a solid. If I then open that beaker up, the gas molecules will continue to spread throughout the room. They're willing to take on the volume of whatever container they are in. And that's true of all gases, not just oxygen gas. So if you're ever asked to predict what phase or state of matter a particular element is in at a certain temperature, you're going to be looking at table S and paying attention to these melting and boiling points. We can use a different element as an example of this. Let's take boron. Boron has an extremely high melting point and an even higher boiling point. If I wanted to know what state of matter boron existed in at room temperature or standard conditions, what we're going to look at is where that temperature falls on boron's sort of temperature scale. So what I'm going to do on this thermometer is put in boron's melting point, which so happens to be 2,348 Kelvin, and its boiling point, which just so happens to be 4,273 Kelvin. Standard temperature in chemistry is defined 
as 273 Kelvin. So that falls somewhere, I'm just going to put ST for standard temperature, at 273 Kelvin, well below boron's melting point. And if we know something hasn't melted yet, it must exist in its solid form. So at standard temperature, boron exists as a solid. However, if I'd asked what state of matter that boron is at 3000 Kelvin, you'd notice that 3000 falls somewhere in between its melting and boiling point. So at that temperature, boron has melted into a liquid, but not yet boiled, so it would exist in its liquid state. If we continued to raise the temperature and I asked about what state of matter boron was at, say, 5000 Kelvin, you'd be able to see that that falls well above boron's boiling point, which would mean it would exist as a gas. This pattern of thinking can be extended to any element you want. We'll know that based on its melting and boiling point, we can figure out whether it is a solid, a liquid, or a gas. And if you want, on your reference tables, sometimes I put an S before the melting point, an L in between the melting and boiling point, and a G after the boiling point. So you can kind of use the melting and boiling points as a number line or thermometer, and you can place, whether it's standard temperature 273 or a different value, along that number line and see if it falls in the solid light range, liquid range, or gas range. The last thing I wanted to discuss was this idea of the aqueous mixture. This isn't necessarily a state of matter because what we would see this as is a liquid. It would maybe look like a clear liquid or a colored liquid, but what we see going on in this diagram is that some pure substance has been dissolved in water. Let's, for the sake of simplicity, call these green dots NaCl, table salt, and these Mickey Mouse looking things, water. For chemists, it's a huge pain to have to write out that this is solid NaCl that has been mixed together with pure liquid water. That's a lot of writing. Instead, what we choose to do is say that sodium chloride has been dissolved in water, put into an aqueous, aqueous form, and that AQ now standing for dissolved in water. So if you see any of these subscripts, whether it's AQ or extending solid, liquid, or gas, what you know is that represents a substance that appears to be pure. The solids, all the particles are the same. For liquids, all the particles are the same. For gases, all the particles are the same, making them pure substances, elements, or compounds. When you see that AQ as a subscript, it, may, it means that it looks like one thing, but we know automatically that it is a homogeneous mixture and is not heterogeneous because that pure substance has been completely dissolved.